Hello, Broadway fans. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby. Here with me is Michael Oberholzer as Shane in the new uh, Broadway revival of Take Me Out. And this, one of the things I love the most about this revival is just seeing kind of the group dynamics that occur on the team uh, on stage. And uh, I, I'm curious, how long did it take? Because you operate as such a strong ensemble with all these guys. How long did it take to find that? together and what is it what is the dynamic like backstage well i mean you know we started this two years ago and uh we had a foundation of rehearsal and getting to know one another and then you know the pandemic happened um and then over the course of those that two-year period you know we all we all kind of stayed in touch you know think life was happening for some of us and you know we were we were on a text thread and we had a a mock opening night party for when we were originally going to open. And so everybody did a Zoom call and we got to see each other and we did a, a reading of it again after some time. And um, yeah, and then and then when we came back, um, it really just there was such a level of familiarity with all of us that, um, you know, we were able to build a team um really quickly and we also did it like a baseball camp uh originally two years ago so we were we weren't even like really talking about the play we were just getting together and throwing the baseball and chewing sunflower seeds and you know just doing like dicking around and playing games and uh so we really did get to know each other on a personal level i think i, I attribute that to scott ellis the director you know he set that up for us so I think all of those building blocks created a foundation for us to then come back two years later. And, and we really just dove right into it, you know, and, and um, we did some table reads and then it was kind of like, these are our brothers, you know, we kind of all, we all know each other in a way. So, and then as far as backstage, I mean, you know, it's great. I mean, there's always, you know, I don't want to speak out of school too much. I mean, what what happens backstage must stay backstage. Um, but uh, we we, uh, we get on very very well. Each, each guy is uh, is shines in this production. Um, they're wonderfully talented. They're all very unique in their own way, um, and they uh, are all essential to the ensemble. And um, so there's not any kind of fierce competition in that way. Um, it really is kind of just like, a, I, I hate to say fraternity because that just has so many connotations, but, um, but there is a, uh, you know, there is a mutual respect and a, a sense of playfulness um, for, for each other and stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's a good time. Yeah, the baseball camp sounds like it would be fun. Did you have experience with baseball at all? Because you do have to kind of look like you know what you're doing out there when you're throwing which on yeah, I mean, I had, a, I had a little bit of it, you know, it's been, it's been many, many years since I played, but um, yeah, I mean, initially when, um, again, when we initially had started a rehearsal, I had wanted to get together with a pitching coach and I wanted to just kind of have an idea. Cause I know that a pitcher's identity, there's an identity with how he throws a ball and his relationship to the mound and to the batters and the internal thing. And, so I just, I thought, you know, this will be kind of fun to go meet somebody who does this for a living and, and kind of talk about it and, and work on a, what Shane's identity would be as a pitcher. Um, but then, you know, and that was great. And that was really, really useful. And then it's like, then you get into the theater and then you have all of these parameters that you have to then work within, you know, I mean, you've seen the play. So it's like, the, there is no mound and it's like, you know, a foot of a fake grass so then you start to just modify it and um and then ultimately you throw a lot of it away but it was um yeah it was it was a lot of fun and and a lot of that stuff you just you just whether or not it makes it into the production or not you just have it you just use it you know um so i i don't think it's really wasted in any in any sense but um was that was that did i answer your question was that your yeah, question yeah you did oh, okay. totally uh, specifically, you know, following down the thread of his identity, uh, he comes aboard as a pitcher and is kind of an outsider at first. He is definitely from a different world than these guys. And I feel like Shane is kind of a character that it would be easy to sort of slip into a caricature, but you completely avoid that. And I'm curious as to how you sort of landed on his voice and his physicality. 
Well, the uh, the void, I mean, I have to give a lot of credit to Richard Greenberg, the playwright. I mean, um, in terms of a character, you know, he had, did a phenomenal job of creating a blueprint of this fictional guy named Shane Mungit. Uh, in terms of, you know, the way he sounds and, I mean, his whereabouts and his origin are suspect and undisclosed. Um, but, you know, the way that Richard wrote the part, if you ever... And you did, but if you, if anybody's ever reads the play, you know, I mean, words are, are written a certain way, and a syntax is 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 woven into into the part, and so you know, he helps you kind of figure out these. Sounds. I don't, I don't, I don't make up situations. That wasn't Michael Oberholzer. You know, I'm gonna play with this word situation. It's like no, Richard was like no, he says situations. You know, so there's a lot of that, um, and then it's just kind of. Um, uh, you know, just playing full out with it, really. Mm. I think that's, for me, that was the biggest key was, you know, you do this with everything, but with Shane, in my experience, you know, you really have to play full out. You know, you have to rehearse at 100% all the time to, to understand and find what he's thinking because it's not this linear kind of emotional journey there's a lot that's being thrown at him and he's connecting the dots in a different way than it's being put together um and i just found that i, I wasn't able to really figure any of that stuff out unless i was really playing at it you know and making a lot of mistakes and you know kind of go going off veering off on a certain track and um but um yeah i mean physicality i mean that was just part of the rehearsal process you know, I had, I had a lot of ideas and Scott didn't like a lot of them and, you know, and, uh, and that's, I attribute that to him, you know, he's, you know, he's a great director in that way. And I'd be like, I want, what about this? And he's like, try it. And he goes, ah, I really, he goes, can I try it again? He goes, yeah, you can try it again. I'm like, what do you think? Nah, not so much. I said, all right. All right. Um, I put a lot of trust in him, you know, um, I, I, you know, he's very, very good at what he does. Um, I know that I, I really want it to be directable. And so I just made it apparent to have a lot of ideas and then not be too precious about any particular one of them. And then if there was a few, which there were, uh, then I would really kind of, you know, go to bat for them. And he was like, yeah, that's fine. Mm. Keep it. You know, I like it. I don't, you know, so that was kind of how we navigated all of that stuff. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, there's been speculation, I think, for many years that like Richard based certain characters on real life uh, people, uh, you know, Shane being one of those characters. Was it, did you go down that route at all? Like, was it worthwhile to you to sort of look at real life uh, figures, real life pictures, or was that not part of your process? Well, I, you know, there was there was talk that this the character of Shane was loosely based off of a real baseball player in the 90s, John Rocker. I think a lot of people know that. Um, but I think if you if you delve into like who John Rocker was and what that event incident was, I mean, at least the way I interpreted it, it was really just a jumping off place because I don't I don't really think of Shane as as, you know, a carbon copy of John Rocker, per se. I mean, he uses some of the same words, you know, but the context with which things are being said and the circumstances of, of how of these things are coming about are, are not the same. Uh, but in terms of pictures, I mean, yeah, you know, like there was a guy, um, Max Scherzer is a, is a, is a very well-known pitcher who's just like, you know, has the, is just kind of insane <laughs> <laughs> on the mound, you know, like there's some memes of this guy that are just, out of this world and um and so when i when i kind of came across that i was like oh yeah there's something we can draw on here um because i think in terms of the whole baseball aspect of shane i mean that's you know there's much more to him but in terms of the baseball lane i mean there is a singularity to this guy i mean this guy throws a ball that's what he does that's what he that's the only thing he can do so to find somebody who gets locked in in this kind of, you know, insane way uh, was was definitely something that jumped out at me. And um, and so, yeah, so I, I took a little bit from him and just some other ball. I just started watching a lot of base, baseball players and, you know, going online and finding a bunch of videos and putting together like a compilation of who I thought, you know, this guy would be 
when he's on the mound. Yeah. That kind of reminds me of one of one of my favorite uh, moments that you have is as he's, you know, as Shane's being kind of dragged out and he's saying, I just want to throw like I need to throw. And it's like this man only has this one thing, you know, that he lives for that could be taken away from him. What it's such a heightened moment. What is it like performing that? Um, it's, uh, it's kind of like, do you ever, did you ever go to like, um, do you ever go to like a, like a community swimming pool, you yeah. know, or, or like a lake, like a, it, it, it's like, you know, they have those like dives and then they have that, that, that crazy high one where you just like, you get like sick to your stomach, like as you like get to the top, you know, it kind of feels like that a little bit where it's like. We're just going to, you know, what's going to happen because the, the wheel, when the wheels come off, it's just like, it's really just a scene that you just have to, to give, you have to submit to, uh, you have to submit to the emotions, you have to submit to the vocal energy, um, you know, you have to submit to the language. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, as an actor, it's like, it's the best. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's the, it's the, the best experience to be able to have a part that demand asks of you and demands of you uh, the stakes that are so high and on one hand, so simple, but they're so high, right? It's like, you know, it's, 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 it's watching a human being's life, watching him watch his life, you know, go down the drain and, 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 and what, what that does to a human being who is like a, a wild animal that's in a corner, you know, that's been beaten, that's pushed in a corner, whose life is like going down the drain, who is a, an amalgamation of all kinds of emotions and feelings and rage and terror and fear. And, you know, and, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I, I'm so blessed and grateful to have the opportunity to, to try to, to try to, to, to do this part, you know, so it's everything. I mean, it's everything, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> and you get a lot of moments like that, I think. Um, and I know when, you know, obviously when this play first premiered on Broadway, like the nudity became like a very big story and oh, your right. character has, you know, normally when we see that on stage, it's a moment, but your character has a really tense extended moment in the showers with Jesse Williams. Um, yeah. Was that like a hard thing to get comfortable with? Is it like, it seems like it might be like an extra layer of vulnerability to already add to a very, very tense moment. Well, you know, we, we were rehearsing that scene. We had a fight choreographer come in and help us with some of the mechanics of certain parts of it. Uh, but, you know, we, we rehearsed, we all rehearsed in our bathing suits and our clothes and, you know, and we just kind of were, um, for the most part, uh, just kind of mapping through it. Um, and then, and then when we got into the space, um, we were, it was very important that we knew what story we were telling in, in the locker, in, in the showers, you know, like there's, that's a story in and of itself. And so we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that we were all on the same page about that. But then when we got into the space and it was all tacked and it was like, Jesse and I, we got, we got naked for the first time. And it was like, just us. And the stage was dark and there was the lights that just came in. It was just this, for me, it was like, you know, everything just kind of, it was like, holy shit, like this is, this is what this scene is. You know what I mean? It's, so it was like, oh yeah, this is, it, it's intense. It gets intense, you know? And, um, but it didn't hit me until that, you know, until we were like really in it and we were really doing it. Uh, fortunately for me, he's a great scene partner and, um, and, um, uh, you know, we have a mutual respect for each other and we, we, we treat that scene very delicately as professionals and, but yeah, it's an intense scene, man, yeah. you know, and we talked a lot about it as a company, you know, how, you know, sexual assault, like, like that has just so much more meaning and it's discussed so much more and it's in the zeitgeist and it's in, and, and like, what does that what does that do to our protagonist and how do we make sure that we know what we're doing is the right thing and is the tone of what Richard wanted. And 
So we did spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. And um, I, I think we did. I, I hope we did. It feels like we did. I mean, you saw it. I mean, what do you think? I would say it was very successful. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's just one of the, the moments of the show that hits you the hardest, I think. Oh, wow. Um, and I, I mean, what, what also struck me about your character in the context of this play is he's not a man of a ton of words, you know, in a play where all these characters get solo moments, these big monologues solo on stage, you don't, even in that, you know, big scene with, with Jesse, you're not, you're not the one who's saying a lot of words. So you, but you managed to stand out without them. Was that kind of a difficult dynamic? What is that like for you on stage where you're not always there with that big monologue moment? Are you, are you still talking about the shower scene? Or Did any of work? them. I mean, oh, cause you know, it's, um, you, ex I, I feel like your character has to express a lot without the big monologues, oh. you know? Yeah, it's, 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 it is, it's interesting, right? Like I, what I love, what people love about Richard is, you know, he's just, he's this wordsmith and, you know, to, to make a play about baseball and have these characters be so language heavy and have it be integrated in such a seamless way um, is, is one of the great joys of being in the company because I get to listen to the play every night backstage. And I'm always just like amazed at moments. But to your question about, yeah, being like one of the few characters that is, uh, is so inarticulate and doesn't have words uh, in a word heavy play. Um, you know, I think the trade-off for me is, is that, you know, behaviorally Richard has given me a robust, uh, you know, job. So in terms of, of a character, while I don't say, uh, you know, I don't speak a whole lot and I don't necessarily get to have these like sweeping ideas that are so eloquently put, um, you know, I get, he gives me the behavior. He gives me a, a, a point to, of, of what's happening and what to do. And, to be an actor and to know what to do is, I think is just as satisfying, if not more in some instances. Um, it certainly keeps me busy. Yeah. Definitely. You know? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I first, I think, saw you in Hand to God, which when I'm thinking about those two plays, they, they could not be more different, I think, in style uh, and tone. Um, and so I'm curious, before I have to let you go, is there, is there a kind of style or aesthetic that you're drawn to when you look at a, a, a project? Is there one avenue you sort of see yourself going down? Um, no, but I mean, if I could be candid, I mean, you know, a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, your options, you see it, right? It's like, you know, what's presented to you, you know, I mean, I remember when I did, after I did Hand to God, then I, I went out on auditions and, you know, I, I heard something from casting directors that I never heard before in my life, which is like, oh, we like him, but he's just not right for this world. You know, like just all these like, pro and you're just like, you know, so it's like, you know, you think like, oh, uh, being in a hit play, you know, it's going to open all these doors. And then people are like, no, no, we just see him as this like 17 year old, like, you know, homophobic, you know, teenager. And then, it, you know what I mean? And it's like, and then you kind of like have to just like wait it out and, and, and see kind of what comes down the pipeline sometimes, at least that's kind of been my experience. Um, but, you know, it's just um, work that speaks to you. I, you know, not everything lands for everybody. And there's been things that, I, you know, have been offered or auditions or plays that I, I thought, you know, this is a really, this is a really great play. Um, but I'm not the right person for this. You know, I have friends. I know people who should be in this play. Uh, I'm not this person. I might be able to act it, but this is an important piece that people that are far more connected to it should be a part of. I felt that way about a lot of things. And um, yeah, you know, I mean, I've got a good team of people, you know, my manager, my agents, you know, they know me very well. They, they know material that works for me. And um, yeah, you know, I wanna shine. I wanna find work that I can shine in, but also be challenged by, um, you know, and I wanna work with good people. 
you know, because I, I, I've been fortunate enough to, to work with some really talented people. And, and I've come to understand and learn that when you work with talented people, it just makes everything that much better and that much easier. You know, when you have a director who can direct you and has a vision and has a, you can just really stay in your lane and really work on somebody like Shane. You know, I don't have to think about anything else. You know, I was, we were in such good hands with the production, with second stage. They gave us everything we needed. Um, I don't know. That was a kind of a long roundabout answer. Was it an answer? <laughs> it certainly was an answer. It, uh, uh, I absolutely understand. Um, I, it's a great work in this. I can't wait to see what happens afterwards for you as well. Um, so thank you, Michael, for sitting down and talking to me. If you're watching at home, make sure you subscribe to Gold Derby. Keep up to date with us. There's plenty other interviews like this with other Broadway performers and artists. And Michael, thank you once again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Nice talking to you.